we have almost 100 years of combined hospitality experience. Now, I've got some grey hair and there's shades of grey hair over there, so hopefully we're going to have an engaging panel and we're going to go through a few different things that is really going to bring revenue management up and alive and, and raise a couple of controversial points. We're going to talk about skills, we're going to talk about pricing, we're going to talk about structure, we're going to talk about all of these different things because revenue management traditionally has always been in that domain, and I'm glad Rico's over there actually, uh, has always been in that domain of a high-end hotel because high-end hotels have been guys who can afford it starting back in the Marriott days where they had servers as big as this room running revenue management, you know, down to software as a service these days. But software, software as a service has also enabled the delivery of revenue management out to the economy-based hotels. And the economy-based hotels that run on such fine line margins really need that revenue management side, whether it's a discipline, whether it's a system, whether it's a process, to be all running and cranking very, very well to enjoy, to enjoy the good profits that are actually there with hospitality and in that uh, economy hotels. So one thing I would like to mention, a revenue management system is not a box from ideas or someone else. It is not just one piece of software. It's your distribution environment. It's your property management system. Importantly, it's your people. And there's also a box that's got some algorithms that does some forecasting in it. That's your revenue management system. So you combine all of those together, that's what's going to deliver the revenue management for you. And those hotel groups that focus on those four areas of technology and people are really going to get the best returns on investment. Now there's a lot of hotel owners here, and these hotel owners are about those margins and those return on investment. So the panel we've got here today is going to share all of their experience in that and a lot more. So it's a very, very specific skill set. And economy hotels have uh, very, very cost conscious models. You, why don't you talk to us, Philip, a little bit about the different ways of deploying revenue management and depending on how that goes and the different models, whether it should be centrally based, whether it should be property based. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it depends a little bit on the situation and where you are, where the hotel or where the brand is at this, at this stage and um, um, how much density of properties do you actually have in the market. I mean, if you have only one hotel in one market, um, which is far away from your head office, let's say, then sure. it may be very difficult to, um, to centralize that because, at least I believe, uh, local um, expertise on your market is very important and then you, meet, you may want to add a bit more meat at the beginning in the hotel as well, in terms of knowledge, um, resources, technology anyway. I mean, this is what I'm a firm believer in as well. I mean, you must invest in technology, but irrespective, people make decisions, not systems, right? So you have to have that, that expertise in the hotel. How, however, I mean, that puts, of course, um, pressure on the cost structure again. Um, but as you get more hotels in one market, three, mm. four, maybe, I think then it's the time to consider centralizing um, processes. Yeah, but, but if you centralise it, say, you, say you've got three revenue managers sitting in Malaysia looking after various hotels all around uh, Asia Pacific, how can you expect those particular revenue managers to have a really strong feel for the markets that they're trying to make decisions in and trying to do forecasts on? Well, as I said, it depends um, how many hotels you have in the remote locations. And if you don't, and I believe you must add more knowledge, knowledge into the hotel, into that, or your head office remote um, location. It may not be a remote location per se, of course, sure. right? Um, but irrespective, again, technology today, I think also enables you in, in your, wherever you are on planet Earth, to get a lot of insight in, in, into the market, what's going on in the mm. market, what's going mm. on in the hotel, and give the right advice to whoever is the driver in the hotel, which is mm. typically the general manager. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, we've seen in the past that um, some owners have some strong opinions on revenue management, I guess, um, not necessarily knowing the discipline and the skill sets and so forth uh, that go around and surround that sort of thing. No, but what experience have you got with owners and their understanding and their application of revenue management in the hotel groups? Uh, it varies a lot, but in general, and I hate to be negative, uh, uh, 
most owners do not really understand it. Uh, and we see, especially in the, in the budget segment, where, where many owners uh, uh, are very much involved in the hotel, uh, unfortunately, a lot of interference. Uh, I can give you an example of just recently, uh, I toured uh, a group of competitor hotels with one of our owners, and he was referring to the rates of his competitor hotels by asking the front desk, what's the rate? And of course, he got quoted rec rate. Hmm. Uh, then right there on site, I went on my iPad online and showed him what the hotel is actually selling on Agoda and, and he had a very rude awakening because it was less than half. Uh, and we find it sometimes a little bit challenging to, to explain to an owner uh, why the rates uh, are dynamic. Uh, another scenario very often is that you have a competitor across the street that maybe has a much smaller inventory than you, is already higher up, has just increased their rates but you're not there yet because we have 100 room more. And it constantly fluctuates and they find it sometimes very hard to, but, to, to understand. But, but Norbert, if it's an issue in explaining that to the, uh, to the owners, how do you actually go about solving that problem? Yeah, just sit down face to face and explain, it's very simple. Yep. And uh, you find that that's effective and, and gets the job done? It, it, it works, yeah. But we do get a lot of calls saying, oh, why is the hotel across the street 50,000 rupiah more than you? And why is this 50,000 rupiah less than you? Uh, and we just have to go through the work and explain it and, and, and then they understand. The best thing I always say is, uh, and I'm not really addressing you guys here because you're all very experienced, uh, but unexperienced owners, they, they, they need to have the face time and the explanation. The best thing I always say, well, next time you're on Garuda, ask the guy next, next to you what he's paying for his ticket and compare with your price and, and then you will start learning more about revenue management. Yeah. Sure. John? Yeah, I'm just going to say that, um, you know, fundamentally, right, when we talk about revenue management, there's always this uh, conception that um, it has to be maximizing top revenues, but not necessarily, right? You know? um, it's really ma managing or, or maximizing revenues at a point when if business is down, you still need to achieve some form of revenue. Because we operate hotels and we manage hotels, and we know that you know, uh, good operations, uh, good services um, means nothing, especially with good cost of operations, right? You know? if there's no income. Hmm. So, you know, right, uh, fundamentally, right, you know, there's a need to, uh, uh, to manage, you know, costs by attaining that income first, which is revenue, and that has to be explained to owners. Because the owners have this misconception that, why can't I get a higher rate? But we always tell the owners, hang on, before we can give you a higher rate, let us give you revenue first. And once we can build the occupancy up to a certain range, right, you know, then we can talk about rates. And if they take uh, competitor hotels as a comparison and say, why can't you know, we get rates like they are, then we have to get them you know, the differentials between you and them, mm. the competitor, like you know, what you're lacking in or what are their strong points or what are your strong points. So these are things that, you know, that really assist in making owners understand that um, you know, it's not all about how we are not that close to what the competitor is, it's, it's what we are offering. Yes. Yeah, qu quite often we, we, we get confronted with, um, you know, revenue management only works in the really uh, busy times and in the really high times. Um, how important is it to have this discipline in place, uh, both right across different spectrums of the market, high season, low season? Like, w w when is the most money to be made or when is the most benefit, which may not necessarily be always be in dollars, be achieved given the different market sections? Philip? Well... <laughs> I mean, I think it's a year-round and a daily discipline that you, that you must apply. So it's a myth that it's only working when you're busy. Even though I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of very busy hotels, we're lucky we're in Hong Kong, where it's a bit easier. But, sure. but even there, there's so much opportunity. Um, so let me talk about busy period first. The, our value hotels in Hong Kong are running 98 to 100% occupancy. So you go, when I was hired first, I went like, what do you need me for? But when you look a little bit closer, even though our G we have GOP percentages of 70%, which is really strong, strong. <laughs> hmm. but um, there's more to the equation, to your point. It's about top-line revenue as well, and there is more top-line revenue that you can make. When you're full, you, need, you must focus on, do I have the right market segment in my hotel? and which has an impact on your rate. So it's not necessarily increasing price, yeah. it's also your market mix that you want to change. And then it is monitoring how do you really perform versus your next door neighbor. And Jonas will love me for this, this is where 
um, products like a Smith Travel, of course, kicks in where you can really monitor um, what's going on in the market. Am I really growing my rate as the market is or am I falling behind? And there's always opportunity on any given day. Hmm. And in the not so busy periods or in the not so busy markets, same thing. I mean, it is about, it gives you, um, it's a discipline of looking at your business from a more long term and from a more strategic point of view, turning on groups business, which has a much longer lead time, and you have to have the right um, sales and marketing activity in place at the right time. It's not just something that you do um, by, you know, I increase or decrease my rate. It's really about having a, a discipline of having a very, very um, systematic approach to the business from a long term really perspective. It's really having your fingers on the pulse all the time. Yeah. And that's why it's important, like, you know, um, um, what Phil was saying earlier on, that, um, you know, if you have um, a revenue manager that's sitting in the head office, which is thousands of miles away, he might not know on that day what kind of occupancies that you're averaging. You know, so or the coming week, he may not be well aware of it because these things change pretty fast. And if rates are down, then the guy on site at the hotel itself has to be, you know, on the ball and mm -hmm. say, look, you know, like, we want to up our rates or we down our rates, make that decision. They've got to call in the managers, they've got to call in the DOMs, you know, right, discuss all this and say what, what, what position or what strategy you want to take. Because we know in the declining market, right, you know, you want to be first to fill up. But in, a, in a, an upward market trend, you want to be last to, to fill up because you can manage yield. And that's what you're talking about. And then from there, if you're cruising an occupancy of 97% like you are, then you know, you got to look at your market mix and say, we don't want to cheap groups anymore. We got to slowly bring in the groups that are paying a little bit more and hence be able to increase your overall average rate. So that's how it works. Mm. Well, you know, part of that uh, demand that's making up those high occupancies are loyal clients. Uh, are clients that keep coming backward and forward, and, and we'll talk about loyalty a, a, a little bit further on in here. I, I'd just like to drill down a little bit on the pricing side of things. Uh, and, you know, you were talking about rates increasing and decreasing. Um, you know, dynamic pricing, folks, has been around, well, it seems like to me forever now. Um, but, you know, it, the more we sort of delve down into the economy hotel market, the more we find the discipline of dynamic pricing is actually not there. There's a lot of groups that are still running single rate pricing and, and just the odd seasonal pricing. So in the economy market sector, guys, what's the, um, what's the acceptance of true dynamic pricing that is moving around with, with demand seriously being as a function of price? Norbert, why don't you have a shot at that? Uh, we find acceptance extremely high. We have no problems. We're using a dynamic rate systems of a set of four to five to six different rates on site. Uh, it's not centralized. Uh, and with proper encouragement and proper motivation, uh, we get our GMs really excited about it, playing around with it, learning about it. And once they see a little bit of success, they get addicted to it. And it works very well. Right. We have no problems with the customers either. They, they have gotten used to it, yeah. What is a little bit of a challenge in a market like Indonesia is where retail travel agents and wholesalers are not really clearly defined. Everybody is doing a little bit of something. There's a lot of old relationships. Sure. Uh, if I do see a challenge, I see a challenge with sales managers or general managers on property to be reluctant to turn off the allotment of a wholesaler because he's buddy-buddy with them. Uh, and it needs a lot of policing, but otherwise it's working very well. Okay. Anyone else make a comment on dynamic pricing? Are you okay with that? Well, um, dynamic pricing, you know, um, as you know, um, you normally come in at, at the lowest rate. It starts with the lowest rate and goes on the next year and next year and next year. What we find in, in, in our system is that um, customers would book rooms right, you know, right up to a certain level where they find it's the threshold of what they can afford. And after that, right, you know, they would then be looking at, at, at sites like um, you know, OTAs to compare if um, your dynamic pricing for that particular tier is uh, in equation with what the market, is, what you're offering the market, you know, right, like the OTAs. And they will then make a selection on that basis. It might not necessarily come through um, your booking site then, you know, right, and you will see that your, your bookings that for that particular tier actually stagnates, yep. and that's it, you know, right? Okay. Um, are there many owners in the audience? H hands up for hotel owners? Management groups? There's no one in the audience, you sure? Okay, so what, what, 
in, in really high demand times, in very, very high demand times in the economy hotel sector, what you can get is you can get a situation where a hotel that might normally charge $45, $50, but in special events is charging you know, $200 and $150, and then you see the next day after that special event, those rates are going back down to lower than their ADR. What do you think about that in terms of price integrity? Like, you know, the, the poor old consumer out there, you know, it's 200 one day, it's $50 the next. Do we care? Do they care? Do you care? Uh, okay. I'm a big proponent of it, right? <laughs> but that's an unfair question to ask. I'm asking the questions here, right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> We own all of our assets, so okay. you know my answer to this. No, but joke aside, I think there is, it has to be in balance with um, what your brand message yeah. is, and you have to look at it from a long-term perspective as well. Of course, there, there are days where you could ask, you know, five-star pricing on, 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 on certain days for a, for a three-star product. Um, is that fair? Is that right? That's debatable. I, I also firmly believe in a long-term, um, you have to have a long-term um, you know, strategy in place as well. But isn't it price gouging? No, it's not. No? No. No? Okay. No? Just checking. No? Just, ma just, just making sure. No, no lawyers in the room here. Yeah, here, okay, right? okay. Okay. Um, no, but seriously, I mean, it, ha it has to be in balance. Of course, you can go up to, to, a, to a certain degree, but in the end, you also have to deliver something that's tangible to the consumer, is what I believe. Yeah. And um, don't stretch it. Okay. Sorry, John, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, uh, it, um, when you do things like raising your price over an event, for example, F1 is coming up next week here, yeah, all the hotels are going to jack up their price. Now, the thing is that, you know, there are basically two components to look at. You have your regular customers, who are your corporate people or your TAs or whoever they are, and then you have the FIT guys or the people just going to book one time. Right, you're going to come in one time. So out of F1 turns FU, right? <laughs> exactly. <right. laughs> you know, so, you know, so what actually happens, you know, like, it, like for us, what we'll do is like we'd still honor, you know, like the guys who have been supporting us. It's a matter of integrity, right, you know, making sure that they are well taken care of, loyalty, so to speak. And, you know, for the guys who are coming one time, we've got X number of rooms um, allocated on a really high rate. You know, honestly, we don't care because we know they'll never come back because they're only there for that experience. Mm. Mm. Fair enough. I want to add to this uh, just one thing. Philip made a very important point. It has to be uh, uh, in line with the brand promise. So when we're talking about budget hotels here, uh, it's a very different story than five-star luxury hotels. And if you're promising a good value, you have to deliver a good value regardless uh, of the period of time that you're in. Uh, the way we do it is we set our rate grids centralized. We do that centralized for our hotels and we establish a rack rate, which is not a fantasy rack rate. It's a realistic rack rate that people are willing to pay. Uh, and we do not go above that uh, in the budget segment. But we would do in a five-star hotel. Now, uh, what is important here uh, for the panel to know is, or for everyone to know, is what's a little bit difficult for us and the real challenge is when we're dealing with OTAs if I'm about to sell out and I'm, I'm, I'm about to overbook actually, and if I close my inventory off on the OTAs, I fall down in ranking and it takes me weeks or days to get back up to where I used to be. The OTAs do not want us to close our inventory. So the only way for me to protect myself from overbooking is charging ridiculous rates on an OTA. And I, I stay on the first page. So I have occasionally already seen a freestyle Aston managed hotel selling for $600 on an OTA simply because we didn't want it to turn off the inventory and lose our ranking. Was anyone buying it? Uh, actually, we had, that's a very good question, we had occasional people buying it and it has always been actually more of a mess than of a benefit. People, price is a very, very important fa factor when it comes to creating expectations and somebody checking into a three-star hotel probably didn't even read the description very well, paying $500, expecting a five-star hotel, and we end up getting a bad comment on TripAdvisor, and it hurts us more than it helps. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. Norbert's well, absolutely right, you know, because, um, you know, you shouldn't be pricing yourself out of your range, which means that if you've got a rack rate that's, um, you know, suited for that property, right, you know, that should be it. That should be the max that you should oh, so, so you're advocating a cap. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Very good. 
Okay, well, let, let's look at the other end of the market, I guess. You know, we had 80... Um, is 80 in the room? I think he might have gone. Um, we had 80 talk about Accor and uh, their flash sales. Uh, and in the economy hotel section, what we tend to see sometimes is that most of the promotions are price-led. Uh, and by price-led, I mean... Um, th there's not a lot of differentiators in, in the economy hotels, so they might go after a different market segment with the families, they might go after a different market segment in a certain area, and they price lead these particular um, promotions. So when you think about these demand generating activities, and you're doing a price leading promotion of, I don't know, say 40 bucks, and the demand to come was already $60, you're actually cannibalising that existing demand. Talk to us a little bit, guys, about how you think about stimulating demand and, and how you think about laying off against the latent demand. Um, Norbert, would you like to have a first shot at that? Yeah, of course. Uh, again, uh, keep on referring back to economy sector being a little bit different. Uh, a low rate will not create demand if there is no demand. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, so going down and down and down and down will not create any business at all. You just need to monitor your competition and stay competitive. Uh, if you're going to go after a new market segment, would you price lead that particular initiative? Uh, not in the budget segment. The, the rates are already so competitive and, and such a good value, we wouldn't go any lower. Okay. I feel exactly the same. I don't. And we're, <laughs> we're, we're running 95% just... Yeah across the board, so we don't really need to at the moment. Yeah. Okay. So, I think so why don't you tell us the flip well, side well, of it? It depends. I mean, if you want to kickstart a new hotel, for example, that's new in the market, you know, um, I think then, then flat, I think actually I believe in flash sales, so let me put it this way. But you have to be, you need to drive it and you need to be very smart about it. And again, it needs to be folded into your overall long-term strategy that you have. What is the hotel? Uh, where is it? I mean, what's the expected occupancy? Is it new to the market? Yada, yada, yada. I mean, do I just need to turn on a revenue stream to pay my bills? Then it may, it, it, it does work and it does give you the revenue that you may need in that particular point. But from a longer term perspective, I think you have to be careful and there's flash sales and flash sales. Some um, you can use for image built, but that does not work for the, in the, in the economy sector, like a, like a chat setter, for example. I mean, you won't get in. And Groupon, I think you have to be careful. I mean, it is, uh, what image do you radiate? There's a difference between value and cheap, right? The yeah, image yeah. that you actually radiate. Well, well, let's talk about Groupon for just a sec. You know, the, the, the statistics um, that are coming out from these uh, particular places like Groupon, Living Social and so forth, is that the amount of um, return visits that these particular uh, flash sales or whatever you want to call them generate is really, really low. Yet the pitch from these guys is that, or oh, once you get your hooks into your client, you'll be able to keep them and you'll be able to have retention and so forth. So, you know, I, I view these Groupon things as, as purely a marketing expense, yes. um, which is kind of all they are. And, and depending on how you fence your rates and how you do all of those things, they might get some quick cash in the bank. But um, overall, it shows that they're actually a little bit damaging, you know, to your brand. Uh, to your price integrity and the expectations of return visits are actually a lot lower than what they're pitching when they're coming to you. So what are, you, what are your thoughts on that and the usefulness of those in the market? As I, as I said, I think I, uh, personally, I think they have a place, but they are, their place is not to generate ongoing revenue for, it, for you. It's just to really, if you need to kickstart some revenue stream, I think it's useful um, to believe that guests who book through them really turn into loyal guests, I think that's BS. That's not happening. Yeah, the thing is, um, if, if you know that you're running into a low period and um, if you can work with you know, one of the flash sales guys like Groupon or whoever, um, you could run 100 rooms on this program, um, get the cash up front, which is what they always tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them might not use it and you know, hopefully it expires and you keep the cash, but that's not the intention. Um, you know, the intention really is uh, to build up uh, customer loyalty because if they tried the hotel, they'd come. But I'm in the opinion that when they actually arrive and stay, it's just going to be a, a one night as well, or just you know, for that one instance. And then they're going to wait again to see if you are you know uh, offering this on, on on flash sales again, and then 
purchase, they'll never be um, buying you online or going through you know, normal channels to book a hotel. That's yeah, my they're, opinion. They're, they're loyal to the dollar, right? That's they're, right. They're, they're, that's what they are. Absolutely. Uh, we, we do not work with Groupon or any of those sites. We find it very, very counterproductive and damaging to our, to, to our image. Uh, I've also noticed, I monitor what they do, Groupon, Travel Soul, whatever. I never really see a really famous, reputable hotel on there. Uh, there must be a reason for it. But what I do see working very well is locally, uh, we have partnerships in Indonesia and we sell F&B products pretty well. We're selling high tea and lunch buffets, uh, coupons in, in a local market, for example, Serpong in a certain area in Jakarta for a particular hotel. And that seems to be working very, very well. But rooms, no, we're not doing it. Right. So I guess it doesn't create loyalty, right? I think we all agree that, that that's not the case. So all of those people, all we're doing really is just training them to be loyal to waiting for the next flash sale, right? right. So let's talk about loyalty in terms of economy hotels. So economy hotels typically have uh, very, very similar offerings uh, across the board. So w why don't each one of you guys take the audience through how you actually create loyalty to differentiate yourself to get that guest because the cost of acquisition of a guest is quite expensive, it really is. The cost of retention is a lot lower. So how do you retain them and how do you balance off that acquisition versus retention? Um, Norbert, why don't we start from your end again? Okay. Um, well, I have to be perfectly honest. Uh, we hotel people, we always talk about how loyal our guests or our brands are, but in reality, is over the last 10 years, it has changed a lot. I see much less loyalty now than I used to be. Uh, I see much more jumping and trying and, and doing something new, uh, and it's becoming harder and harder, especially in the budget segment. Uh, having said that, uh, being extremely strict about your brand standards and the consistency of your hotels, uh, is really the best way to create loyalty and maintain it. Do, do you actually think loyalty exists in that sector? Or do you think it's an outdated concept? Uh, it does exist, but it's, 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 it's not that big. Okay. All right. Well, I'm in the opinion that um, you know, loyalty actually does exist. Um, you, know, you, you may start with um, offering a, a, a low price to get the guy in, but I think if everything remains constant, that means to say that if um, you're comparing yourself with all the other economy hotels within your area and everything else remaining constant, that means, um, you know, facilities wise, etc. Um, the next thing that the customer is actually looking at is actually your services. And I think, you know, if, if you provide services that are reliable, um, you know, up to the expectations of the customers, right, you know, there's no reason why they can't be loyal to you. And, you know, and um, we've seen that because um, they may find problems or, you know, no one's perfect. We make mistakes when we operate a hotel. And when mistakes occur, you know, it's important really, you know, to um, have quick customer recovery. And yep. I think when you get quick customer recovery, right, you know, that's the key of making you know, your customer your champion. That's when they really become loyal and they say, look, you know, these guys are serious about business. We raise a comment, we raise a complaint, uh, we're faced with a problem, right? They don't you know, duck you know, this responsibility. They um, work hard to resolve it. And you know, why don't we go back to them? Because they can go and try, you know, like everyone, that, like um, what um, um, Norbert's saying, that, you know, they're probably, you know, hopping around hotels, trying out. But ultimately, right, you know, I think they're also looking for a home base. And if they can, you know, uh, work with a brand or um, a particular hotel that, you know, offers them that kind of reliability, they, sh they should be loyal. Uh, yeah. Right. What about you, Philip? How do you think the creation of loyalty is best achieved in the economy section? Well, <laughs> I don't think it exists to begin with. <laughs> I think loyalty is completely out the window in the economy sector, pretty much. Hang on. Who thinks loyalty is out the window in the economy sector? Nobody. Well, Nobody. That's so, great. Okay. So, well, yeah, let, let, there was one let, hand. There was one there hand. Was one hand down the back there. I, I hand, I'm not surprised. <laughs> and, <laughs> Thank and you very reckon, much. And um, there might be some other people that secretly think it is too. All right. But anyway. Um, no, I really believe that, that, that what are the core decision making factors when it comes to staying in a, in, a, in a loyalty hotel, in an economy hotel, is primarily its price and its location. That, that's the two key drivers. Cool. Yeah? Um, and uh, in a very busy market where there's a lot of competition, if you, you, you must put other 
other means in place to protect yourself from having to go over price all the time. Otherwise, that spiral just continues where price mm. goes down and down and down because you just monitor what your next door neighbor is doing and you drop it by another dollar and they drop it by another dollar and so on and so on. So you have to have certain, um, you know, more tangible value basically is yeah. what you have to add to the product so that um, you can stimulate consumer preference over that. Um, that has nothing to do in my eyes with loyalty. That has just something to, to do with, with preference. Where do I prefer to stay when the hotel is next, when they're next to each other in the same location at the same price, right? I mean, there must be better ways and there are better and smarter ways to actually stimulate that consumer's um, behavior other than dropping it by another dollar. Mm. Yeah, there are, ma there are many different components to the creation of value. You know, there's the position of the hotel, there's, you know, the facilities of the hotel and there's obviously the service of the hotel. I, I think the three of you agree that, you know, service is really uh, one of the key components because bad service annoys us all, regardless whether it's an economy hotel or whether it's a five-star hotel. One, one of the other guys that was here before, I think one of the IHG people, uh, mentioned that um, they outsource a whole bunch of their services so that the people on property can be more customer facing and, and have their services done better. Um, just in terms of revenue management, and we've just got to wrap this up fairly quickly, what do you think the opportunity is for truly outsourcing revenue management within the hotel industry in that economy sector? IHG seem to have done it reasonably well internally, but what about the independent hotels? John? I'm just going to give this a pass so and just give it a bit of thought. Anyone well, uh, then let me jump in. Uh, we would not outsource it. Uh, first of all, Graham, you're far too expensive. I can't afford <laughs> you. Uh, secondly, I mean, the owners hire me to do it. Why, why should I have them pay somebody else to do it? Then I don't understand that. It's my okay. job, my responsibility. Philip? Um, for the end, of, well, it, you know, I think it... Uh, I would agree with Norbert here to not outsource this necessarily for an independent hotel. Um, it's a very good question, Graham. Hmm. You're, are you you're just well, you're no, my, for business my, here, right? Yeah, I am trying to dig up a bit of business. Um, I, I, my, my view on it is that I don't think the industry is ready for it yet. I, you know? I'm in the opinion yeah, that we're, look at us. <laughs> we're, we're, we're masters of, of, of a lot, but masters of none, right? I mean, we're champions of a lot, but masters of none. Yeah. Um, you know, being in the hotel industry, we can do a lot of things, but there are obviously a lot of things that we're not up to. Um, you know, so if, if you take a service that you have got no knowledge over, it may be best to outsource that to someone that could do it and give you, you know, some income from it. You know, that but you, could but be you've still got to be masters of your own destiny. Sure, you really you know, do. Right. You yeah, really you do. Know, but, but ultimately, right now, um, you know, um, outsourcing only comes in play when when you're talking about, let's say, take a specialty restaurant. Um, you know, five-star hotels have Japanese, Korean, Italian, whatever restaurant. But we know that it's very hard to find one person to be, um, you know, that master chef and keep him there. Sometimes it's, it's worthwhile considering, you know, right, getting, you know, a, a person that owns a Japanese restaurant and say, why don't you take this lease on and, you know, outsource it and yep. let the guy just run the business. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Uh, well, we've got a few minutes before we finish. Uh, are there any questions for this 100 years of combined panel expertise here? Um, yeah, I've got a, a question. It is working. Uh, or an observation, perhaps. Uh, I, you know, I think you, you kind of subsequently explained what you meant by loyalty, Philip. Um, but I think the notion that customers in this space are not or ultimately won't be loyal to brands is a bit frightening. Um, you know, I think you only need to look at the airline business, which is on, on, the on the budget side a lot more mature to see how much loyalty there is for brands like Southwest Airlines in America and even EasyJet. Uh, and to a lesser extent, even now, airlines in the Philippines like Cebu um, Pacific. Um, which has a very distinct brand and, uh, in my experience, of travelling on them a lot, pretty good standards of service and, and uh, on-time arrivals and departures and so on. Um, I wonder, I guess my question is, I wonder to what extent is the fact that people are somewhat promiscuous and try lots of different brands 
at the moment is because we're in a pretty immature market. Uh, the, the budget space is pretty new. So people are saying, hey, there's lots of new players around here. I'm, I'm going to have a look around. I'm going I'm to check out what's there. And that probably will go on for some time. But ultimately, um, I can see a situation where people start to form not just a relationship with the brand because they give you the basic services uh, in an efficient manner and they give you good price, but actually the experience is something that's more memorable, more distinct. And that's not just about a promise through marketing, that's actually about delivering mm. a, an experience that is in some way um, reflective of those people's lifestyles. So I, my question is, do you see this sort of promiscuity changing and ultimately, therefore, uh, the issue of loyalty becoming more important as uh, perhaps the market matures a bit? Well, I think it's a bit... I did not want to say that there is... I mean, I think the difference to me really is there's a difference between being loyal to a brand that I already know and I already know what to expect versus, I mean, in this playing field where, where consumers are today, there's a lot of new brands or non-branded hotels coming into the market. Are they really loyal to a particular hotel or our particular brand? Because I really believe there's a, there's a new travel group as well that has emerged that didn't exist before, thanks to probably the budget airlines yeah. that were coming into the market. This group did not travel before. So it has a completely new travel behavior, consumer behavior, um, decision-making behavior, and so on. But I think what we need to be mindful of and learn from what was happening in the United States or in North America, um, where everything is commoditized, not only in the budget, uh, but also in the, in, even in the five-star segment today, right? Where everything is about, it's only about price now. You drop five dollars for seasons, then Ritz Carlton drops five dollars. It's ridiculous. And I think this is, we have an opportunity here where we can prevent that from happening by adding more tangible, a more tangible message to the consumer and, and the right value, actually. So I think branding is extremely important, um, but I don't necessarily believe that it creates loyalty, but it's a preventive measurement by radiating the right message to the consumer that it's not all about price. That makes yep. a bit more sense. I agree with you. I think it's quite new as well. And um, a as that um, newness starts to mature, um, you'll start to see that these uh, brands understand the needs of their consumers a lot mm. better and they'll have a better idea on how to create that loyalty. Mm. And then uh, additional to that, you heard Michael say and some of the other speakers earlier today, saying that they're coming in with sub-brands of what was their economy hotels to specifically address mm. and, and capture some of that loyalty mm. as well. So yeah, I think it's a maturity issue. Uh, yes. And as that goes, it will go. Thanks. Okay, I think... Uh... Thank you guys. Would you guys like to put your hands together for the panel?